Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to answer your invitation in Isaiah 1 to come now and let us reason together. It's, it's assuring to know that, that you created us to reason with you, to reason with your word, with the blessing of your Holy Spirit. We know spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so we ask for that blessing today as we delve into this, um, uh, into this material. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, coming out, ministries uh, formed 12 years ago, I guess next month. Uh, we were out, uh, we all met together at the SoCal camp meeting in California. I was speaking there and I was doing music and, um, and we, someone knew of several of us that were doing the same type of thing individually around the country and, and even internationally. And I'd been doing a lot of international travel as well. But we all came together and met for the first time to see if, <clears throat> if working together as a team could have the potential of a greater impact than all of us individually and it has proven to, to work much better that way. Um, we chose the name Coming Out uh, because we were familiar with some texts of Scripture, but also we like to redeem things that the enemy has stolen. Um, I still have in mind to write a book called Reclaiming the Rainbow because that rainbow does not belong to the world. Uh, God created it, and um, it's a rainbow of promise, and I still want to do that, but um, the term gay, I mean, we sing about being gay in the church hymnal. Did you know that? It's, it's in our church hymnal, uh, but that term has been um, corrupted. Uh, the term coming out, uh, the, uh, the idea is coming out of the closet, gay and proud of it. Uh, last month was June, Gay Pride Month, and I did a sermon called Beware of Pride. I think you touched on my sermon today, and you've never heard it. But anyway, I was really blessed by your presentation. Um, but uh, I think you said anything that, um, any prefix to the word pride has got to be bad news. Yeah. And so... We, uh, we soon found out very quickly that in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, uh, well, I'm going to start with Revelation 18. We're all talking about Revelation 18 this week, and I don't know why this keeps popping up, but, but uh, that's the, what we call the fourth angel, uh, the angel that, that, uh, that joins up with the three angels. But the message there, and I'll just go to the highlighted area because... Um, we're all very familiar with the passage of Scripture. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. That means a lot to me because all of the years that I lived in the gay culture, I read this text and I see God called me out of her. Babylon, confusion. And I don't know that there's anything more confusing than the LGBT culture. You know, it used to, uh, we used to just talk about, when I was a child, I heard the term homosexual for the first time. And it was explained, you know, people of the same gender that, that uh, pair up with each other. But then later, then I heard about uh, gays and lesbians. So now you have the men homosexuals and the women homosexuals. And then it started growing from there over the years to LGBT, bisexual and transgender. Um, and just to race through, right now, I think there are 15 or 16 letters in the acronym. Let's see if I can remember it. 2-S-L-G-B-T-T-Q-Q-I-A-A-P-P -P plus. And I could add three more P's to that that are involved. And it's like everything that is not biblical sexuality is gradually being adopted into this acronym and I sometimes tongue-in-cheek call it the alphabet acronym, but, but they're now claiming over a hundred genders. There are not enough letters in the alphabet to cover all of those. And that's why they're already duplicating letters uh, to come up with the acronym. 
But God loves these people. He's not willing that any should perish. I know that he, he did not give me rest day or night when I was in that world. And I studied my way out of that culture strictly with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That was it. I had gone through counseling when my wife and I were here. I married uh, while I was here as a student, um, thinking that marriage would be the solution to my confusion. But marriage is not the solution to any problem. In fact, <laughs> I like to say to young people, beware. Marriage can be the beginning of woes <laughs> you never expected. If you're not married to the right person for the right reason, with the blessing of God, and with the right chemistry. And so I very quickly discovered that my marriage was a big mistake. Though we were married several years, I chose to have a Christian wife and Christian home and to make Christian babies, and we made two of those, and to have a Christian education and prepare for Christian service as a medical missionary. I took pre-med here and, and theology, and, and I paid for it making nutty bars. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the nutty bar line, um, and that's how I tried to get through school. Um, but, but marriage was not the solution. Uh, but the reason I'm talking about that is because my wife was a Christian. She loved me. She wanted our marriage to work. She was forgiving. She didn't want to break up the family, and she asked if I would go to her, I mean with her, to some counseling, and I owed her that. So I went to counseling, and we went to some very professional people. And if I mention names, all of you are in the generation, except you maybe, that you would know some of these names. They were that famous. The thing that stuck in my mind and then later stuck in my craw was that they counseled my wife to divorce me and get on with her life because that kind can never change. Mm -hmm. See, that's a lack of understanding of the 1888 message. It's a lack of an understanding of the gospel. And that's why I wouldn't go to pastors, counselors, um, you know, psychologists or anything. Uh, when I was desperately trying to find my way out of that life, I went to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. I found all of my answers. God has blessed us immensely with light. I mean, light that, that um, is just spectacular. And... A lot of times when we go outside of that, we end up being confused because it contradicts light. And we have a movement today called Posture Shift in which um, the movement is urging the church to shift its posture about the gay issue. But we're trying to urge the sinner to shift his posture to come in line with the Bible. You know, it's an opposite approach. And um, God says, you know, in Malachi, I change not. But anyway... Um, we really like this text come out of her, my people, because our message is for far more than just the gay issue and even the sexuality, sexual purity issue. We find people of all different uh, struggles relating to our message because the bottom line is we're preaching victory over sin. Amen. And we're doing it through our experience, which happens to be LGBT etc., etc. Um, and so we love this passage. Uh, 1 Peter 2.9 is the one that um, we drew our name from or we identified with first, where Peter talks about being called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And, um, and then 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18, verse 17 says, Come out from among them and be ye separate. So we have... We have coming out texts of Scripture. We also have trans Scripture for the trans community. I like that one in, uh, is it uh, 1 Corinthians 12? Now I'm drawing a blank. But be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. And I say not by the mutilation of your body, but the word says by the renewing of the mind. If you feel like you are a woman in a man's body, that feeling is not coming from your toes or your body parts. It's coming from your mind. And God says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's something wrong in your mind. It's not your body. It's your mind. 
Psalm 139, you know, God talks about how he formed us in the, you know, in the mother's womb and, and he delicately knit together all the body parts and everything. And, and it, it just, um, it, it uh, is really a sad thing to see so many people trying to make their bodies fit their thinking. And all they're doing is cosmetic and it's not, it's not um, good surgery. It mutilates a perfectly good body. All of that surgery does nothing to the bone structure. It does not change the chromosomes and the DNA. Uh, every fiber of the being, I believe, really declares who you were created to be. Uh, I, I want to talk today about the all-important <clears throat> all question. And um, this comes out of Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas uh, were in the Philippi for a couple of weeks in turning the world upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, they got themselves in trouble there as they delivered this woman from her demonic possession. And uh, she was a fortune teller. And uh, when she lost that ability through her demonic possession, then her masters lost their means of income. They took Paul and Silas before the magistrates. Um, and we see here in verse 22, the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now what I'm sharing uh, this afternoon is principles that I had to come to grips with before I had the nerve and the courage to turn and walk away from the gay culture. And um, it's interesting that as I went to the 1888 conference last year, I remembered that shortly after I came into the faith, I went to the 1888 conference up in Berrien Springs. Um, that was probably 25, 26 years ago. Whelan and Short were there and a fellow named Peterson and then there was Herb Montgomery and I remember some of those names. And as I got reacquainted with the message last year, I realized, you know, I think some of this material came from that encounter 25 years ago and I had forgotten. But you may hear some things that are familiar, but they stuck. And, and what I learned and, and what I have studied has really worked with me. Now, uh, so we're going to look at this all-important question and then eventually look at the answer to the question. But here we see Paul and Silas, they're, they're being tortured. They have, they've been flogged, beaten publicly. They're suffering. Their feet are in the stocks. I was in one of those types of dungeons, I suppose, prisons in that part of the world years ago on a ministerial tour. And there were these big iron rings in the wall in this inner dungeon. Uh, the inner dungeon has no windows, so it's as black as a cave when there's no torch or no light in there. And I asked the guide, what is the meaning of those big rings? And he said, well, that's where they would chain the prisoners with their backs to the wall. So the, you get the picture there. They could very well have been chained like that. They're suffering, they're, they're being tortured, very uncomfortable position. And uh, at midnight we read that Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. The details in this story are so fascinating to me, I can relate to many things in it. Um, first of all, I just kind of chuckle when I see midnight. Paul, who gave us the fruits of the Spirit, the last one is temperance, right? But there's a reason and I think it's because they were suffering and they could not sleep. They were not being intemperate. Their, every fiber of their being was probably crying out uh, in pain. Uh, and they could not be silent. And so to relieve their pain, they prayed and sang praises unto God. And then it says the prisoners heard them. It doesn't mean overheard. It means it caught their attention. I would imagine in that prison that there were others also suffering and probably crying out in pain, cursing and swearing and making all kinds of commotion. And then they hear the sound of music. And it's praise music, praise to God and prayer to God. 
and it caught their attention. It had a profound influence on them, as we will see. Um, suddenly there was this great earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And I have to marvel at that kind of an earthquake. I can see the prison being destroyed, but what about the chains and the stocks? What kind of an earthquake is going to do that? I can't help but believe there was some angelic intervention, something going on there, because when Peter was released from prison, it was a silent escapade. You know, The chains fell off silently. No one else was awake. And Peter, you know, and the angel tiptoed out and went through the doors and and he was released. But God works in different ways for different reasons. And it's fascinating to me why he did this. Because the um, everyone's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. If only one prisoner had escaped, he faced a certain public humiliating execution and in, the, in that Roman culture. And so I just assumed that he thought he could save himself the public humiliation and just execute himself. So as he was about to kill himself, Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm. And this is what gets me, for we are all here. And, you know, I like to say, I mean, I don't like to say, but I have been in jail a couple of times, but I, I have, <laughs> I've never been in prison ministry. So uh, you can figure that one out. And so I marvel when I see this that he could say we are all here. And I have to think, why are they all there? I mean, I can see Paul and Silas staying put, but what made the others? I mean, I don't think that if there was angelic intervention to release them, that they then sat on them and held them in place. There had to be something other than that. And I believe it was the influence of Paul and Silas. Amen. They had a calming effect over that whole scene. They had already established themselves of people of dignity and assurance that had faith, that, um, that were calm in the face of persecution. And I think that just without really realizing what they were doing, the other prisoners kind of looked to them for leadership because they obviously had it all together. That's kind of my imagination on that. But nevertheless, um, they were all there. And the jailer called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, and this to me is such a peculiar question, what must I do to be saved? We're still asking it. <laughs> yeah. All right. But I, I, you know, I take that text in invitation of God seriously. Come now, let us reason together. And I reason like a little child in many, many ways. And so when I read what must I do to be saved, he was already saved. He was about to kill himself. So why is he saying, what must I do to be saved? He didn't have to do anything to be saved there. Why didn't he say, how can I repay you or thank you or show my gratitude? No, he said, what must I do to be saved? Now, a lot of people might think that's a legalistic question. But this question is asked basically three times in the New Testament. And in no case were they told there's nothing you have to do. Jesus did it all or Jesus will do it all. They were all told, they were given different answers, but they were all told what they had to do to be saved. But we're not going to go there just yet because um, I want to focus on the question. In, uh, in commentary... On the 144,000, I think it's in Revelation 14 that I came across this. One of my favorite studies is the one I did on lessons from the 144,000. That was so enlightening. But it says here, Christ says that there will be those in the church who will present fables and suppositions when God has given grand, elevating, ennobling truths which should ever be kept in the treasure house of the mind. 
When men pick up this theory and that theory, when they are curious to know something, it is not necessary for them to know. God is not leading them. It is not his plan that his people shall present something which they have to suppose, which is not taught in the word. It is not his will that they shall get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as, who is to compose the 144,000? What does that have to do with this story? Well, it's what comes after that. This, those who are the elect of God, will in a short time know without question. Isn't that amazing? And then we have to know who the elect are. Well, I'll share that at the very end. Uh, a very beautiful definition of the elect of God. But um, when I did my study on the 144,000, I took this seriously and I said, well, but Ellen White says we're to strive to be a part of the 144,000, so there's something we have to know. We may not know this and have to suppose that, but what is it we do know? We know their experience, we know their character, and we know their destiny. So let's talk about those three things, if I'm doing that subject. But we're not doing that right now. Um, I want to go to the next part of the quote. My brethren and sisters, appreciate and study the truths God has given you for you um, and your children. Spend not your time in seeking to know that which will be of no, be no spiritual help. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is the all-important question, and it has been clearly answered, which we'll look at later. But I want to look at the question. So, if this is the all-important question, that means it, that's kind of like a superlative, isn't it? It's paramount. We really need to know what we must do to be saved, to inherit eternal life. And when the jailer asked that question, I see a story in the question. I believe he was probably in the audience listening to Paul and Silas preaching for those two weeks in Philippi, and he was under great conviction. He was introduced to Jesus Christ, and he was drawn to Jesus Christ, but he had not made a decision for Jesus Christ. And I just, it just really impresses me the lengths to which God will go to get one person over the line. And in this case, it was a great earthquake to get that man to make a decision. And when he said, what shall I do? What must I do to be saved? He knew exactly what he was asking. The all-important question. And we're going to look at that. And I believe it's the same that's on the hearts of many people, many honest people today. Um, you know, there are certain things that they may ask, sir, do I need to search for new doctrine? Do I need to do more charitable work? Give more in offerings? Be more faithful in church attendance? What kind of questions are those? Aren't those kind of legalistic? But that's doing. So what must, what must I do? You know, I I'm, I'm, was amused when I was in New Zealand several years ago and I was... I was presenting this message, basically. And I said, you know, there are people that never miss church on Christmas or Easter. And this other speaker, I didn't realize he had been a Catholic. And he was an Adventist for 10 years. And he interrupted my sermon. He said, oh yeah, we always call them C and E Christians. Christmas and Easter Christians. And I thought... I don't have an original thought anywhere. Someone always, <laughs> always preempts or whatever. But anyway, um, the observation. But the point is, why did they go to church at all? And I think it's because they believe that if they go to church, they go to heaven. But isn't that like seeing how little you can do and still earn your way to heaven? That's legalism. If you love God so much you can't stay away from prayer meeting and you can't stay out of Sabbath school and church and you're involved in all kinds of outreach and everything, that's not legalism. I mean, it could be, depending on your motive. But people like that are accused of being legalists, and especially if you keep the Sabbath, called a legalist. But no, this is a legalist. The C&E Christian, that's a, 
That is the perfect picture to me of legalism. So what must I do to be saved? And immediately I have to ask the question, saved from what? Right? I mean, the jailer, what must I do to be saved? And Paul could have said, you're just saved. What's, what's your question? I mean, why are you, why are your question? You know, uh, when you go to a physician, for example, like a family physician, he's going to ask you a question when you go in to see him. And I mean, he already knows your name. He has a chart. But isn't he going to ask you, uh, where's your owie? And how did you get it? And, you know, where does it hurt? And that type of thing. Um, well, God does the same thing uh, when he says in Jeremiah 3, only acknowledge thine iniquity and I will heal your backsliding. He wants you to acknowledge your need. Now, God doesn't need you to tell him what the issue is. God needs you to acknowledge what the issue is. Otherwise, he might be healing you from something that you don't want healing from. Then he would be um, stealing from you or coercing. So, again, that passage, come now, let us reason together. Um, but I, um, as a little boy in Mississippi, I was one of, I am one of six <laughs> siblings. And when I was about, you know, from 10 to 12 years old or so, we lived in this little country house next to this little country store next to a little country church. And every once in a while, the little country church would have a little country revival. And we were little Seventh-day Adventist kids, and we were mischievous. Um, we, we were in the Adventist culture, but I don't know that we were converted yet. So we knew a lot, but we didn't really, we were not of the Adventist faith necessarily. We had a lot of growing up to do spiritually. But we would love to go to the Advent, I mean, the uh, Little Country Revival and watch what was going on. Now, we would not go inside. It was scary inside. Hellfire and brimstone inside as they're scaring people to the altar, you know. But from the outside, we thought it was kind of amusing. We were safe on the outside of the church. And I think there's a lesson in that too. But anyway, um, I remember one time that this uh, young boy came to me after one of these revivals and he said, Ronnie, I was saved last night. Have you been saved? And I had to say, say saved from what? And, you know, and when you ask someone, ask most Christians that, they have an answer. Uh, they may not have it right up front. I was flown to Mexico City to visit with this very wealthy family. They had like 52 department stores in and around Mexico City. And two years earlier, they had flown, the father and son had flown to Little Rock, put me up in the hospital to counsel for several days because the son was gay. And then two years later, the son contacted me and he was reading my book for the second time, this time for himself, and, and he was converted. He was going to give his heart to the Lord. He was going to turn his back on that. He was going to move back to Mexico. He was studying to be a chef up in Poughkeepsie, New York. And, um, but then after that, they had another son. It turned out there was another son who was gay. 40% of their children were gay, two out of five. <laughs> and they said, well, this time we're going to fly you to Mexico City. So you can spend some time with us and counsel our other son and the whole family wants to meet you because of the first son turning around and all of that. And I, I spent the week down there. We had a wonderful time. And this other son, he, was the, he owned the number one modeling agency in, New, in Mexico City, importing and exporting models between New York City and Mexico City. Uh, perfect environment for the gay culture. Very nice young man. The family said, you know, we used to be Catholic, but now we're Christian. I thought that was an interesting statement. They're not Seventh-day Adventists, but we used to be Catholic, but now we're Christian. <laughs> uh, so it was late at night, around midnight again, uh, that I was talking to this young man, David. And it was time for him to go and get to bed and everything. And he finally said, you know, Pastor Ron, all I, all I can say is I know that I'm saved. And this came 
back to me and I said, saved? David, saved from what? The look on his face was very interesting. He didn't know. And he very questioningly, questioningly said, uh, save from hell? I said, David, Jesus didn't come to save you from hell. That got his attention. <laughs> he came to save you from earning the wages of death. He came to save you from sin, the wages of which is death. He can't save you from hell if you keep earning the wages. I mean, you're going to get the consequences, you know. And he had never thought in that term, but I think many Christians think in that way. And, you know, when, um, when Jesus came to this earth, the Jewish people were desperately looking for their Savior. They wanted uh, salvation from the Romans, foreign occupation, from overtaxation, disease, poverty, demon possession. In Desire of Ages, we read, uh, well, there's the quote there, but basically it's saying that the very organs of these people were controlled by demons. Jesus came to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And a number of the cases where he uh, cast out demons was people in the church. Why was the church in such a pitiful situation? You know, God had promised that they'd ride on the high places of the earth. He promised he would put none of these diseases upon them. He'd put on the Egyptians. But God had not failed his people, but his people failed God. All God's promises and threatenings alike we know are conditional. And uh, so basically, the Jewish people wanted to be saved from the consequences or the wages of their rebellion, apostasy, back, backsliding, and their sins. And I think it's that way with many Christians today. As I was mentioning this, this family in Mexico City, the young man, he, uh, he thought that once he acknowledged Jesus, he was saved from hell. So I think it is with, with many Christians that um, they too want to be saved from the consequences and they worship God out of fear of punishment and hope of reward. And when I think about that, I think, how is that different from the way pagans worship? Pagans do drastic things to appease their angry gods so they don't get their just rewards. Or they will go to great lengths to bribe the gods to receive something they don't deserve. And I think many Christians are doing the same thing. They talk about being saved, but they're not being saved from sin. They're saved from hell. They're saved from punishment and saved to heaven. I don't think God wants to be worshipped that way, do you? Uh, the same way the pagan gods are worshipped. Um, I um, was living in California. I was in marketing and uh, in construction sales. And one of the biggest jobs I ever sold was, um, that can't be right. My goodness. One of the biggest jobs I ever sold was to an Adventist couple. And um, I was on the job a lot because it was a big job. And somehow when you're on the job a lot and you're smoking and whatever, somehow they found out I used to be an Adventist. And they invited me to their church. Um, I became their mission project. And they kept bugging me about going to their church. One Sabbath, I decided to go to their church. I didn't tell them. But I went to their church. And um, the, the guest speaker was um, a professor at a seminary. And he was announced as someone who had studied his way in to the Adventist faith from Catholicism by reading The Great Controversy. At this stage in my experience, I was searching and I was reading the great controversy myself, and I thought, this ought to be good. So as we uh, were sitting there listening to this sermon, about halfway through the sermon, when people start nodding and dozing, that type of thing, I like to say, kind of like now, um, he slipped in a statement that to me was shocking. He said, of course, we all know we will be sinning until Jesus comes. Yeah. You've heard that in Adventism? Yeah, more than one. 
And this was from a professor from a sem I'll say a seminary. And I thought, wait a minute, that ain't right. <laughs> If he knew, and if that church knew who I was sitting on the back row dressed for the bar rather than for church, because I was, I was deep into the bar scene, a dance instructor and a dancer, and I, I smoked, I drank, I did drugs and, you know, all those different things. And he's up there saying we'll be sitting until Jesus comes. What is that telling me? And... I was shocked. And to this day, that's the only thing I remember from that sermon. Isn't that a terrible thing to remember? I mean, that, that that's the only thing that stuck in a sermon was that you'll be sinning until Jesus comes. Here's what I had just read recently in The Great Controversy, page 489. I'm just going to read the highlighted part. Satan is constantly seeking to deceive the followers of Christ with his fatal sophistry, deadly masterpiece of deception that it is impossible for them to overcome. And that's what I got out of that sermon. As a person in the world, I was not an Adventist, I was not a Christian, I was studying. But I was shocked and I went away very disappointed. The couple saw me leaving and they came to me and asked me if I would join them for church. I mean, for lunch. And I thought, well, that's nice. And so I got in my car to follow them home, but we didn't end up at their home. We ended up at a big, beautiful restaurant overlooking downtown Los Angeles. I don't have a problem, or I didn't have a problem, eating out on Saturdays. I was not a Christian. I was not an Adventist. But eating out with Seventh-day Adventists after church on Sabbath, that was different. I was, it was so awkward. But while we're sitting there eating... The, this couple, they were very well-intentioned. You know, I'm not judging their intentions. They really wanted to help me stop smoking, drinking, <laughs> carousing, and all of those things. And um, she looked across the table at me and said, Ron, how's it going with those cigarettes? Is the Lord giving you victory over your smoking? <laughs> I was stunned because I had just heard in their church that I could be sinning until Jesus comes, but that's not what they heard. They evidently heard, we will be sinning until Jesus comes, but not you. <laughs> so, I mean, the questions that went through my mind, I said, no, he isn't, but in my mind, I'm thinking, my, is God, is, um, is God giving you victory over breaking the Sabbath and bringing me with you? You know, we're eating at a restaurant on Sabbath. I thought, that's odd. They didn't see the inconsistency, but I'll tell you, visitors will see the inconsistency. That's why I say we need to be consistent with our message. Um, because I could take that same thought and apply it to something else. The Adventist church spends millions, if not billions of dollars trying to convert Sunday keepers to Sabbath keeping. Well, why can't those Sunday keepers sin until Jesus comes? Many of them are godly people. They love the Lord. They just, they're, they're, they just don't see that yet. Why don't we let them sin until Jesus, Jesus comes? And, um, and I thought, what is it? We'll be sinning until Jesus comes. Does that mean only if I sin is it like the Adventists do? You know, they don't, they don't smoke and drink and dance and all this kind of stuff. So maybe they mean we can sin our way, but you've got to, <laughs> you have to, Stop sinning the way you're sinning and sin the way we do. I mean, the log as I reason this out, it just all made no sense whatsoever. But the point is, <clears throat> I was studying for myself, and I didn't buy it. I felt pity for the guy from the seminary, and I felt pity for these people who were long-term Adventists, and I was seeing things more clearly than they were. But they were in the church, and I wasn't. But I was on a journey. Um, as I continued my study, I found that there, were, there are three phases. And I think this is something I got out of the 1888 conference 25 years ago. That as the all-atoning Lamb of God, Jesus does promise to save us from the penalty of sin. That's good doctrine, but it's not standalone doctrine. The whole Christian world 
believes in forgiveness. And you see the bumper stickers, forgiven. But I keep looking for the one that says cleansed. You know, it's a one-sided, lopsided gospel, which is not the gospel at all. Um, if we confess, we're forgiven and cleansed. But you never see the cleanse, it's just forgiven. So the whole Christian world loves this doctrine of Jesus taking upon him the consequences, the wages of our sins. Um, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus does promise to come, take us home, to remove us from the very presence of sin for all eternity. That's good doctrine. But if those are the only two points that we're hanging on to, it's no different than paganism, is the point I'm trying to make. There's another key doctrine, our one unique doctrine. As far as I know, it's only in the Adventist faith. It's in the remnant church. It is a remnant message. It's three angels' messages, and it's of us. And that's why I say the Seventh-day Adventist message is the answer for this LGBT issue. As priest and high priest in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary now, Jesus promises to save his people from the power of sin itself. That's what separates us from pagans and separates true Christianity from false Christianity. I think, I think it's that simple. Now, I'm still learning in all of this. So, I mean, if I need correction, I had to write an article once. I had a newsletter going out and I... The title of one of my articles was, I Stand Corrected. <laughs> so I can be corrected if I, if I uh, am in error here. But uh, here we read, Jesus came uh, to save his people from their sins. The definition of sin is the transgression of the law or disobedience. And then the next question to me, like a little four-year-old child, is why? Do you remember your kids with the why questions? And the one asking the question is always in control of the conversation, right? Try to bring an end to the why questions. You finally send them to bed. Because <laughs> they'll just go, why, why, why? Every, everything, every answer you give can be why. But if we're to be saved from sin, why is that necessary? It's a good question. And before we look at the answer to what must I do, I think we need to look at the why also. And it's because the wages or consequences of sin is death. That's why we need to be saved from sin. So, another thing, if, if sin is disobedience, uh, again, we get accused of legalism when we talk about obedience. But if we have the proper understanding that obedience is the result of salvation, it's not the means to salvation. Right? If Jesus came to save me from my sins, what role does my obedience have in that? My obedience is the consequence of his saving me. So that, that to me just takes a load off that our obedience is the result of salvation. It's not the means to salvation. And I think the Jews and Seventh-day Adventists of that day um, had lost their message, and maybe a lot have lost the message today. Now, let's go to the answer. What must I do? There are three incidents in the New Testament where this question is basically asked, and we'll look at the, the jailer Philippi last, but just real briefly, the tempting lawyer uh, came to Jesus. I think he was a theologian because his, his answers came from the law. Uh, he said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And I'll just paraphrase. And Jesus said, uh, you know, you're, you're the lawyer. What's in the law? How do you read? He didn't quote civil law. He quoted God's law, the, law of Moses, the laws of Moses and all. That's where he had his PhD. He said, basically, love God supremely and love your neighbors yourself. And what did Jesus answer? This do, and thou shalt live. Sounds simple, doesn't it? If you love God supremely and love your neighbor as yourself, uh, you shall live. That sounds very simple. Um, but love is an action word. In this context, it's an action word. It's something you choose to do. It's not something you necessarily just feel. It's not puppy love. It's not romance. 
it's, um, what is it, agape, love. You know, I like to ask the question, is God homophobic? You know, does God hate gays? Is he afraid of gays? Is he homophobic? And I say, no, he's homo agopic. Yeah, he's homo agopic. He loves gay people. He's not willing that they should perish. He died for them too. I mean, isn't that what the 1888 message is about, that he died for everyone? Is that the legal justification principle we're talking about? Yeah. Well, then in Luke chapter 18, there was this young man that was wealthy, a young man of authority. I'd like to think that's a formula for spiritual disaster, to, have, to be rich and young and have authority like that. But he, he was pretty, pretty sure of himself in a way. Maybe not too sure, or he wouldn't be asking the question. But he also came to Jesus and asked, Good Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And, um, and Jesus said, Well, young man, you, you know the commandments. And it intrigues me that Jesus, who spoke the Ten Commandments from Sinai, you know, there are people that say, Well, Jesus never talked about homosexuality. I say, Well, then you don't know Jesus. Jesus in the New Testament was Jehovah in the Old Testament. It was Jesus who spoke from Sinai. Jesus who wrote with his finger the Ten Commandments. You would think he would know that the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But no, he says, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. <laughs> he started with number seven. I don't think that's an accident. Because while we look on the outward appearance, God looks where? On the heart. And I think he was reading that young man's heart and he knew that he had a problem with lust. Now he had not openly committed the sin with another person, but he probably lusted, and Jesus elsewhere said, if you look on a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery. So Jesus is going down, he's looking at his heart. The way I read this, he's reading his heart. Do not commit adultery, and do not kill. Well, he hadn't murdered anybody, but he probably hated the Samaritans, and hated the Gentiles, and probably would have called for a stoning if a Greek was brought into the temple, you know. So that tells me that he had an issue of, of that kind. Do not steal. Uh, he'd never robbed anyone, but God says, but maybe you've robbed me. You know how in tithes and offerings, and we read about how um, the widow with her two mites gave out everything she had. The rich young ruler may have been stingy with his giving. I'm sure he returned a faithful tithe. I read somewhere that in that day when they harvested their spices, they would actually count the leaves. Nine for me and one for God. Nine for me and one for God. Think of the time it took. They could have weighed it a lot faster and then just given a little bit extra to make sure that it was an honest tithe. But I, I picture this young man that way. Maybe he was uh, uh, very exacting in his tithe and maybe very stingy with his offering. Uh, but anyway, as Jesus is going through these, the young man interrupts and says, well, all these I've kept from my youth up. And Jesus um, says, yet yeah, one thing you lack. And, and I love this because he says, one thing you lack, and then he names five. <laughs> he says, go, sell all that you have, give to the poor, come back and follow me. That's five things, at least five steps. But in essence, uh, well, it said that... Um, he then was very sorrowful and he turned away. He was very rich. And we read that Jesus loved that young man. Of course he loved him. He loves all of us. But um, he turned away. So the young man thought he was keeping Ten Commandments. He said, all of these I have kept. And Jesus points out, no, there's one thing you lack. While he thought he was keeping Ten Commandments, he was in essence breaking two very important ones. Which ones? Love God supremely, love your neighbors yourself, right? He was a legalist because he did not answer Jesus' call to do that. Um, so the answer to the all-important question given in these two accounts is to love God supremely, your neighbors yourself, and if you love me, keep my commandments. These are things we do if we love and remember He's saying, if you love me, this should be an act of love, not a legalistic act. It should be a love response. However, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23.
And so all who have sinned need a Savior from sin. So therefore, we go back to the jailer of Philippi. And um, he said, uh, what shall I do to be saved? And Paul gave this answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And all Christians can say, hallelujah, I believe, right? But James says, wait a minute, not so fast. You believe there's one God, good for you. <laughs> uh, the devils also believe and tremble. So there is a belief that is not a saving belief. And, you know, there's a counterfeit for everything. When God says believe, the devil comes up with something that's a counterfeit of that. And so when I look at the words, the Lord Jesus Christ, these words have profound meaning. And what Paul is saying, if you look at the words, uh, the meaning of these words, the word Lord throughout the Bible in many, many places replaces the word Jehovah. The great I am, the eternal self-existent one, the creator God. Jesus, deliverer, savior from sin. And Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. In other words, in those three words, Paul is saying, believe on him who says, I am. Remember, I am that I am. I am Jehovah, the eternal self-existent one, the creator God, anointed by the Holy Spirit to be your personal Savior from sin, and you shall be saved from sin. And you put those three answers together. To me, it's the gospel in a nutshell. What must I do? Love God supremely, love your neighbors yourself. And if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, so we need a Savior. And if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. And <clears throat> Ellen White has a quote here that to me is, is just so beautiful. Review in Herald, August 1, 1893. Through all ages and in all nations, those who believe that Jesus can and will save them personally from sin are the elect and chosen of God <clears throat> his peculiar treasure. So there we see who the elect are. They believe that Jesus can and will save them personally from sin. It's like Paul said, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, anointed by the Holy Spirit to be your personal Savior from sin. And I like this elect and chosen of God, his peculiar treasure. I was up in Poughkeepsie, New York a few years ago, and I was pulling my rig because I, I drive with my marimba. It's so big I have to pull it in a trailer. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was looking for a place to park and I parked, I found a parking, a little parking lot next to a jewelry store. I grabbed my camera and ran into the jewelry store and I asked to see the manager and I asked if he had one of those magnifying lenses, you know, that they stick on their glasses to look at peculiar treasures. He said, well, yes, I do. And I said, well, I'm a pastor, and I'd really like to have a picture of you doing that as an illustration. Could you, uh, like, would you humor me? And he said, well, sure. What would you like me to look at? Well, that was neat, because I, you know, I think jewelry is beautiful. And you're the one that's talking about Lucifer and Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. And, and I just preached on that about all, every precious stone was his covering. It must have been beautiful. And those stones had meaning because to me it's like, you know, you see generals with all these ribbons and medals. In Britain they call them stars and garters. I didn't know that until I was grown. We had a lady at our school, Little Creek Academy. I always say, my stars and garters. And we teenage boys would go, ew, who wants to hear about her garters, you know? I never knew. So... When I was asked to preach at her funeral, I looked that up. I thought, Star that's one thing I really remember. What does that mean? Where did that come from? And that's where I learned that the British use stars and garters where we use medals and ribbons. It's, it's all these accolades and awards for campaigns and accomplishments and, and all these things in the military. And I think, well, that must have been how Lucifer was decorated. Every precious stone was his covering. 
And it has meaning because God assigned that, those awards to him. If you go down to a pawn store, you can buy a pawn store, pawn shop. You can buy medals and ribbons and stuff and pin them on yourself and try to impress people, but they, they're meaningless because you did it to yourself. They're not bestowed upon you for some honor. So that's the way I look at at jewelry. Why is this not charging? Oops. I've got a low battery going here and I'm plugged in. Ah, okay. Well, anyway, as I look at that jeweler, that idea, the jeweler, as he's looking at that gemstone, he's looking for something. He's looking, are there defects? Is there anything I need? Maybe it's a diamond in the rough. And what he does, he cuts, he whittles, he chisels, and all of that polishes until that stone reaches a state of perfection. <laughs> the stone doesn't do it. The stone allows it, right? And, and when we read that we are his peculiar treasure, I think, wow, he will personally work in me, on me, and through me to perfect my character to where I can be a peculiar treasure for all eternity in his, in his treasure chest. They, the quote goes on to say, they obey his call, they come out from the world, and they separate themselves from every unclean thought and unholy practice. So what must I do? As we submit to the process, that's what we do. We obey his call. We come out from the world through his grace, his power, his strength. We separate ourselves from every unclean thought and unholy practice. It is a process. It is quite a process. The thing of it is, it's doable because he's the one that is doing it. And when I apply these principles to myself in the gay culture, it made sense. And I was able to, you know, just speed ahead to turn and walk away from that life. Now, that doesn't mean I walked away without temptation, but I was now equipped to deal with it. Remember, there's so many texts of Scripture. Submit yourself, therefore, to God first. Then resist the devil. Then he will flee from you. Don't try resisting the devil and then apologizing to God. Submit to God first. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Um, so there are a number of texts that I will wrap this up with. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the beautiful commentary on that is that the new birth consists of having new motives, new tastes, and new tendencies. Isn't that amazing? You won't find that outside of the Adventist church. I don't think. This is from the wonderful gift of the spirit of prophecy that God has given this church that are willing to obey him, to love him and keep his commandments. A genuine conversion changes hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong. Wow, that's powerful. These are things I read while I was still in the gay culture and I was not offended. I perked up and I remember thinking, wow, there is hope for me. That kind can change. I was given false information, you know, in my youth. And this just meant a lot to me. Um, we read, and this is something I got from last year when I was uh, with the conference, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, yet do not therefore conclude that the upward path is the hard and the downward road is the easy way. All along the road that leads to death, there are pains and penalties. There are sorrows and disappointments. There are warnings not to go on. God's love has made it hard for the heedless and headstrong to destroy themselves. And all the way up the steep road leading to eternal life are wellsprings of joy to refresh the weary. And the way I picture this is, <clears throat> I used to scoff at this when I first heard this thing about easy to be saved and hard to be lost. I said, yeah, right. It's a lot easier to coast down a hill than to climb up a mountain. 
But what I was not realizing was, coasting down a hill, I may be empowered by the supernatural efforts of the devil. But the roadblocks are omnipotent, come from omnipotence. The roadblocks of God are divine. They're greater than the empowerment. And going up the narrow way, I may find roadblocks by the supernatural enemy all along the narrow way, but I'm empowered by divinity. And it makes sense. This is so logical. You've all known this all along, haven't you? To me, it's so logical. Up the narrow path, you're empowered with divinity. Down the broad way, you are impeded by divinity. So I found that to be very helpful. Uh, in closing here, Revelation 21, 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I shall be his God and he shall be my son. That's relationship. That's intimate, isn't it? But John chapter 1, that talks about how he came unto his own, his own received him not. But in verse 12, it says, But as many as did receive him, there were many Jews who did. The early Christian church was Jewish, Messianic Jews. But as many as did receive him, to them gave he power, that's grace, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And what's the name? Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on him who says, I am Jehovah, the eternal self-existent one, the creator God, anointed by the Holy Spirit to be your personal savior from sin. And you shall be saved from sin. And friends, this works with a gay issue. It works with a sin issue, period. Satan thinks he is so clever that he has taken the sin issue, I mean the gay issue, and he's taken it out of the basket of sins, and it's now a social issue, a birth issue, an acceptable alternative lifestyle. And as he separates it from the basket of sins, he thinks it's off limits. And he's convincing even the church that God himself cannot change gay people. Whenever we have a Q&A, question and answer period, there's almost always someone who raises their hand and says, well, what about those who are just born gay? That's a lie. I mean, I have a lot of documentation on that. No one is born gay. I remember when I was born, not really, but I, re <laughs> I remember being very, very young. You know, I remember being an infant in a crib watching my mo mother through the slats as an infant. I remember being, you know, up to about four years old. I have vivid memories Never had a sexual thought, period, about boys or girls until I was molested at the age of four. And then I never lived a day after that without thinking about it, reliving it every day of my life. It turned into self-abuse because I was reliving it over and over, fantasizing and wild imaginations and all of that. I wasn't born gay. I was conditioned. I was groomed. I was pushed. I felt rejection, and that's another. My testimony is a whole different presentation. Uh, <clears throat> but we, in our ministry, we're taking that issue and putting it right back in the sin basket. And I simply decided to apply God's remedy for sin <clears throat> to my issue, and it works. I, I stopped making excuses. I acknowledged it was a sin issue, and I applied God's remedy for sin. And I was able to turn and walk away. It's not that simple. It's that simple in principle, but not in practice. It was very difficult. Birth is a difficult process, right, you mothers? <laughs> it's difficult for the baby, too. They come out screaming, right? <clears throat> it's traumatic for the baby, too. And so it was a very painful process when I was born again. I was almost killed in the process by my partner. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the Lord spared my life and put me in ministry. Amen. The night I was baptized, <clears throat> excuse me, the night I was baptized, I was asked to preach the next Sabbath. That was 30 years ago, and I've been in the pulpit ever since, the very night I was baptized. Um, like Jonah, long-term Jonah. I trained in ministry. I trained right here in a degree, with a degree in theology. So when I was baptized that very night, God says, okay, let's go with it. And... So I've been in ministry ever since. Um, we only have a few 
moments left. Do any of you have any questions? Well, let me just say that this is kind of a foundational study with me. Wherever I go, I try to present this because it's foundational. Do you see it as foundational? What I'm going to share tomorrow, called Yet Without Sin, I'm going to share a little bit about Mark's testimony because I prepared that study after the 1888 conference a year ago. The very next Sabbath when I got home, I played hooky from church. I stayed home and I wrote a sermon, Yet Without Sin. I presented that at his church in Boston. There's a fellow who drove, drove 500 miles to come hear the program that weekend. He was converted that night, Amen. that very night. I, I want to share some of that with you tomorrow. 41 years he had been counseled to just love himself. That's backwards. And so he struggled. He didn't want to be gay. But here I'm getting into his testimony already. But, hmm. but that one weekend gave him what he needed. And I say it was the Adventist message. It was the 1888 message. And when he heard it, the lights went on and he's been praising God ever since. So, any questions real quick before we go? You know, yes. Just, just one. You mentioned the, the whole born issue. And I, I've looked at all the studies and I, I really think your way of articulating is, is right. Um, do you tend to try and avoid that argument? Oh. This is what I mean by saying, because even if, even if someone believes there's a genetic influence, let's mm -hmm. say they believe that, mm -hmm. But you have a statement up there, for example, that said um, the new birth overcomes all cultivated and inherited tendencies. Yes. So, so you could almost make the case, I don't need to argue that point with you if you buy into that. Mm -hmm. um, because even if you were born a certain way, as you said, you can be born again a different way. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel it's best to both address the born issue or just point the fact that however you, whatever influence you're born with, the gospel is more powerful. That's an excellent question, and I'm glad you pulled me back to that because that quote is not talking about specifically the LGBT issue, but it covers it. And the, and the reason I love that so much is because we like to share. You know, our ministry, uh, we want to inspire you through our testimonies. Then we go beyond that to enlighten by educating about the facts about this issue, facts dispelling the myths. Born gay is one of the myths. And then we want to equip with the resources that we've developed. But uh, if someone, if they're open, we share. We have scientific reports that say that it's absolutely impossible. There's no, no one is born gay. Even gay activists are saying no one is born gay. It's those that wanted to, uh, wanted to piggyback on the 1964 Civil Rights Act to get... Um, to get privilege, uh, what do they call it? Um, minority, status. minority status. They want to get minority status, and they decided to piggyback on that. And you have to be born that way to piggyback on it. So they decided they'd start proclaiming it and loud enough, long enough, frequently enough to where people now believe it, even in the church. But, you know, I, I have all the information on that, how it was political and psychological, but it's not scientific. Uh, and then the science comes out and says, no, that's not true. Well, anyway, if a, a person is open to it, we can share that. But I hear people say, well, as far as I can remember, uh, from the time I was born, I was attracted to the same gender. And then I say, <laughs> then I'm thinking, then you were molested because you don't think sexually as a baby. You're not going to, in a wholesome, normal environment, you will not think sexually until somewhere around puberty. But we're bombarded from every direction through the media and, and politics and legislation and social services. Bombarded. There's now over a hundred genders they're identifying and they're teaching people in kindergarten how to find their place on this spectrum between male and female. Now that's child abuse. That is absolutely child abuse. Introducing to them to something they're not capable of processing and then conditioning and grooming them with that. But when they say that, to me it's a red flag. They have been introduced prematurely. If they say, I've been attracted since as far back as I can remember. But they don't always remember traumatic experiences. But they, they may remember, I mean, they think that. I don't get it. I don't debate them. 
because if they are of that mindset and we show them the evidence and they're open to looking at it and they say, but, but, and I say, okay, Jesus is still your Savior. And he gives you the same invitation he gives everyone else. Be born again. Start over. It's, you know, that's what he came for. We all are born with tendencies. We're fallen. So we're all born with inherited baggage of one kind or another. It may not be sexual, but it may be a weakness that the devil knows about and he will, he will fill in. It's like, you know, water seeks the lowest level. You know, there may be a weak area in your genetics and the devil will come in and, and he knows it. And that's the easy target and he'll do something. But to be born again then you're starting over. You, if you're truly born again, you're not going to blame your genetics because now when you're born again, you're a partaker of divine nature. Amen. Your father is now God. And you can't say that I'm born again, but I was born gay. He's not going to born you gay again, <laughs> right? He's, that's not, no, he wants, if he condemns it, he's not going to, he's not responsible for it. If he condemns it, he has a remedy. And that's one thing I like to say. If God condemns it, he has a remedy. Otherwise, he wouldn't condemn it. And he condemns that. And many other things. You know, I've listed all the abominations in the Bible in one list. And uh, there are many things in that list that, um, that we might think are just little things. Um, but the three sins most and especially offensive to God are pride. You put anything in front of the pride, like you say, <laughs> and selfishness and covetousness. And I thought a lot about that, and then I realized why that's so offensive to God. Those three sins made a devil out of Lucifer. They're the roots. And you'll never kill a tree by picking the fruit. You have to kill the roots, cut the roots. They made a devil out of Lucifer. Lucifer, so you can see why God hates it, because it robbed him of his kingdom, of his children on this, this planet. So he hates those three sins, and, um, and he can save us from those two. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I, what's that? I, I had a, a thought. My son, I found out he was gay when he was 15. Because I had done a search, history search on the computer, I you know I'd mentioned that to you before. But later on, I asked him one time um, if he had ever been molested because, you know, there was times when we had him with um, somebody, you know, um, a family that had other children, you know, that they watched him during the day occasionally. And, uh, but I just wondered if, I asked him if he had ever been molested by anyone. He said he wasn't. I'm, I'm not sure he, I believe him. I don't know that he was lying or... Well, he may not have been. Very young or but you can be introduced without being molested. Yeah. Through, the, through the media, through magazines, through pictures, through conversation, through suggestions. There are all kinds of ways <clears throat> that a child can be sexualized prematurely. Yeah. And uh, depending on the circumstances, he can throw you this way or that way. And Satan doesn't care when he derails you. He, when he plows through, he doesn't care whether you fall this way or that way, just so you fall off the track. And that's why God says, you think homosexual is, homosexuality is abomination? So is adultery. Heterosexual sin is abomination just as well as homosexual sin. Yeah. Yes. In, uh, I think it's Second Samuel, First or Second Samuel, where it says that the sin of rebellion is like idolatry. Yeah. So we think, you know, we are so good, so clean. No, we might. Our sin might not be something that is on the news every evening. Mm -hmm. But um, and so that makes our sin even worse because we don't feel that we mm -hmm. need to acknowledge it. But God can clean from anything. I was born a sinner. So were we all. So he's not going to say, okay, I'm able to cl cleanse you from this sin, but not from that sin. No. That's why we need the mirror. That's why we need the mirror, the law. So that, that way we see our sin. 
I, I really want to encourage you to come tomorrow if you can because that message, I mean, I've seen that turn up a gay person just immediately. immediately. Um, and it was such a, a revelation to me when I sat home and I pondered and I, I thought about that. It was, it was really new light to me as I really studied it and looked um, uh, and worked it all out. Uh, the, in Revelation talks about, and we read a text here. No, in Revelation 3 to the Laodicean, uh, Jesus said to him, that overcometh, even as I also overcame. So that's kind of our springboard tomorrow. How did he do it? He's saying we can do it the way he did it. How did he do it? And can we do the same thing? And we, it's very easy to say, well, he's God. Of course, he can do it. I left the church with that attitude. He's telling me to be perfect. Well, it's easy for God to say, you know, I'm not God. <laughs> and I have a totally different understanding now. Um, and so I hope you'll come back tomorrow. Let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the time together today to delve into your word to search out these issues, to reason together with you and with your word and with the blessing of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that this uh, presentation will be helpful to everyone here and um, it will be enlightening and encouraging and equipping. Uh, basically, everyone here raised their hand saying they know someone, they may be related to or associated with someone who is gay. Lord, we need to know how to, uh, to relate to them in a redemptive way, not in a, uh, not in a, a, an affirming way, but a redemptive way, as Jesus would do. So we pray that you'll continue to work in us and equip us to that end. We pray in Jesus' name.